Um, so I'm going to shift from the natural system into the social system and how that interfaces um, with our fisheries. And um, because the uh, if fisheries are important, which I happen to believe they are, um, both to feed us and to provide us with communities and livelihoods, um, then we have to know how to live within the bounds of the ecology that we're in. And that's not a small feat. This whole conference is about failing to do that on a global level. Fisheries is kind of a microcosm of the planet's problems. Um, so um, now that we are acknowledging climate change and seeing it ourselves in our own time, um, we're, uh, we have to figure out how can we try to have Maine's fisheries be resilient um, given that tremendous uncertainty and change that we're dealing with now and going to be continuing to deal with. So I thought I would take you through the management of two different species um, of Maine fisheries in the past, uh, look at how they have prepared us as a state and the fishery itself, the fish, the critters themselves to be resilient and then see where we might go from there. Because I've been saying for a while that in some ways climate change gives fisheries science an opportunity to make changes that have been needed for a long, long time. and um, and. We don't, there aren't answers in this new world, but we can maybe learn a little bit from the past and, and uh, go forward. So I wanted to include some solution as well as some problem. So first of all, fishing really matters here. Um, if we're talking about this peninsula, um, fishing is so, so important for income, for livelihood, which is slightly different, for commerce, and for our communities. Um, Hancock County catches about a third of the state's lobsters right now. And <clears throat> the area from here to Eastport to the Canadian border catches about 90% of the state's lobsters. So, um, <clears throat> and there are 4,800 lobstermen in Maine, lobster licenses, commercial lobster licenses. That's a lot of families, that's a lot of people that they employ, that's a lot of uh, spin-off in the communities. 70% um, of those lobstermen are in the area from Penobscot Bay to the Canadian border. So this is a problem we need to care about. So I'm going to give you a quick tour of fisheries management. Don't, um, don't dread it too much. <laughs> they, we, there are a lot of jurisdictions in um, fisheries because the ocean system is complex and there probably will be more in the future. But right now, um, ma sta the state manages the fisheries that occur primarily in the area from zero to three miles. And I'm sorry that I don't have a pointer. The feds, um, the federal government manages all the rest. So you see that, that the federal footprint is much bigger than the um, state footprint in terms of jurisdiction. In terms of productivity, that coastal band is extremely important. Um, so who does the managing? Um, inside Three Miles, the lead agency is the Maine Department of Marine Resources, Pat Keller, who's the current commissioner. Um, <clears throat> and the state works with other states in what I always call a kind of a UN of states um, called the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. It's all the Atlantic states coastal states. And what's significant about that body is that they agree together on what the approach should be for the coastal fisheries, striped bass, um, alewives, lobster, um, those kinds of, of creatures. And then the implementation of the rules is done back at the state level. And what that means is that the plans that are developed by those states working in concert really are grounded in the ecological and therefore political and community realities of each state. And there's a great leavening and conversation that happens in Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission about what's practical. Um, out in the federal arena, it's managed um, the regionally 
Um, there's a, a body uh, called the New England Fishery Management Council. You can see one of their meetings in the picture on the right. And um, they uh, make plans, and then National Marine Fishery Service implements and enforces those. Um, so I'm going to take you through cod and lobster. Um, and basically, the um, traditional fisheries management model, which has been studied by every student of fisheries in every university for uh, certainly um, uh, 50, 80 years now, is the common sense one that you would think, uh, we need to control, they're taking too many fish, um, so we need to figure out what the right number of fish is to take. Um, there are probably too many fishermen because some of them are poor and some of them are rich and we need to make that, um, we need a, to smooth that out um, or it's a waste of society's resources to have these uh, poor fishermen uh, dubbing along doing fishing. So we'll limit the number of fishermen and um, we'll allocate them a portion of the quota and the fish stocks will rebuild if they need it or stay high if they aren't. This is the model that all the environmental um, organizations have, have supported it's, and it's codified in the law called the Sustainable Fisheries Act, which was um, originally the 200 mile limit law that passed in the 1970s. Um, sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. So um, for cod, the Gulf of Maine is the, uh, is the unit that is managed. So stocks are assessed at the Gulf of Maine level, and then um, a quota is set, and fishermen are allowed to catch a certain portion of that. Um, in this case, uh, they, the fishermen who are allowed to fish are people who had fishing history at a certain volume um, in the 1990s. And then, um, and at that point, we had lost our codfish, as you saw from Ted's slides in the Eastern Maine. And so we didn't get mon many of those. Maine did not get many of, much of that quota, and in fact, did not get many of those permits. Um, those who can fish now are people who own permits, which are traded on the open market, and they lease quota from people who have more quota than they do. Their quote and. Um, and so what happens is, in many cases, you have hired captains and um, what's called slipper sh skippers, who are people who own the, own the permit and own the, um, own the quote, access to quota or have the capital to get it. Um, <clears throat> these are the results. Um, I'm showing you landings figures in both lobster and cod, but in both species, the um, landings figures do mirror the, um, the biomass figures. So um, it's not a pretty picture. Um, it's actually stunning because the Gulf of Maine ecosystem is pretty much um, dominated by lobster right now, not by fish. And when I say cod, they're managed with a suite of other ground fish species like haddock and pollock and flounders, and the same thing has happened uh, for the other species, with the exception of haddock offshore, which we won't get into right now. Um, lobster is a really different model. It does not, um, and I'm going to talk about the three highlighted areas on the right. There, the lobster management has controlled how, what, when, and where lobster is caught. Um, there are limits on fishermen's mobility in contrast to the codfish fishery and um, our access rights are based on an owner operator model. So um, the how, what, when, and where many of you may be uh, uh, familiar with, we don't allow dragging for lobster, we uh, have trap limits, we limit the size of the trap, we put vents in so Lobsters can, ex um, can <coughs> escape. Uh, we make sure that the lobsters can escape out of lost traps with biodegradable panels. We don't catch eggers. We V-notch them so they can live to 
egg out again, and um, we have minimum and maximum uh, limits so that we protect babies and we protect large uh, reproductive females. Science has moved a lot in the 40 years um, that I've been involved since the 70s. Even when I was commissioner in the mid-90s, the scientific advice was that um, having large breeders was not a sensible strategy. Uh, now they've discovered that those, the eggs from those large breeders are actually um, high in lipids and, and uh, probably more productive than the juveniles who are, re the very small lobsters that are reproducing. Um, the big, big uh, additional change in lobster management happened in the mid-90s um, when uh, there was a combination of a control on effort, in other words, control on who can fish, a, um, and a trap limit that was put in. And what evolved in the legislative process was a seven zone arrangement where every state lobsterman would um, choose what zone he wanted to, or she wanted to fish from and then would be limited to fish in that zone and in the, with the possibility of, of fishing less than 50% of their gear in an adjacent zone. Um, this was meant to mirror what had evolved over the years. If you look at the lower left, um, Jim Atchison, the, the anthropologist at the University of Maine, um, had mapped territories, and probably most of you are familiar with the fact that lobstering is informally territorial. And so now Maine has, um, has zones, um, and it also, at the same time, put in co-management so that the lobstermen in each zone had the, had the ability to, um, to make certain decisions, like how many traps they fished, what their trap limit was, and what, um, how many traps on a trawl, things like that. Um, and um, well, I guess I'll, I'll go on. So then the, the other key change was that they, the state put into law an owner-operator rule. Um, when Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries held a workshop with fishery managers from both coasts of Canada, Canada and the U.S. and asked the question, what's the most, single most important policy thing to put in to keep a community scale fishery, a local fishery? Everyone said owner operator. This means you don't have the situation where the rights to fish migrate to capital somewhere in state, out of state, or out of the country and have hired people. It, has, it means that the people who are fishing are responsible for the stewardship that's happening uh, on the boat, how the, how the product is handle, handled, whether they're, what they're doing. And there are no ownership rights. You can't buy and sell uh, lobster, Maine lobster licenses. When you're young, you aspire. In the middle age, you are really good. And at the end, you um, enjoy going fishing. Um, the results have been stunning. Um, has it all been management? Um, a 300% increase in landings. It's the the um, little red arrow in the on the on the x-axis is when I was commissioner in in the early 90s when the upturn happened. And since then, there's been a 300% a increase in landings. Well, if you look at these two fisheries. Lobster has been managed in a particular way so that when the climate changed, it was able to take advantage of the, the creatures were able to take advantage of the favorable uh, uh, water temperatures. So the, the hypothesis right now is that the warmer water in the eastern Gulf of Maine is allowing the lobster's habitat to expand into deeper water. There are more places where settling lo uh, lobster larvae can, can go down to the bottom and find a place to be able to, to uh, live productively. Um, the cod has not uh, fared as well. It's probably because of an item, uh, the, its stock structure and a number of other things I'll mention in a minute. 
Um, but in the meantime, our social structure has reached the point where it can't adapt because we've lost access rights to fish, if, even if they can come back. So um, I wanted to just point out that I think climate is going to challenge the management regime we have for lobster in the long run. Fishermen are fishing further offshore. Their, their boats are bigger, beautiful, heavily leveraged. Um, it's, it's a uh, scary situation because um, they've been able to pay for them, but if something happens, they might not be able to. Um, crew is no longer your nephew or your son or your grandson. It's much more of a uh, offshore type fishery. And then the climate related changes in plankton that are driving the uncertainty about where the right whales are going to um, uh, show up are is ending up with taking away the protection that nearshore lobstermen have had from the whale rules. And it's going to drive the rules to ask lobstermen to fish fewer vertical lines, therefore more traps on a trawl, and therefore not the kind of localized fish around this rock with these two traps and fish over here with something else, but instead in big grids of 40 traps by 40 traps. That's really going to change things. And if it goes inshore in the long run, um, it, it will challenge the social structure of the lobster fishery and therefore the management structure. Um, what's next? Very quickly, I just want to leave you with a thought that it may be the time now to really try to figure out what ecosystem-based fisheries management is. That's a been, everyone has known we need to shift to that, that the numerical approach is overly simplistic um, and not necessarily, no matter how complex the models get, they get better and better all the time, but it's still not gonna deal with this very complex system that we're living in that is now changing rap much more rapidly than we knew it was before. Um, and we've learned a lot about the marine environment in the last 40 years. Um, we've learned that cod have a lo local stock structure that many fish, including cod, home just like salmon. Um, the scallops in the Gulf of Maine, in the Goulsboro Bay, they're genetically distinct from the, the scallops outside the mouth of Goulsboro Bay. It's stunning, the diversity and complexity that exists. And of course, prey matters. We're finding that with the plankton and the, um, the, the calanus and the uh, right whales, and we know it with fish, but we've been ignoring it for a long time. So the alewife res uh, restoration that many of you may be involved with is probably really, really important um, and may make changes in our local ecology that we never dreamed of um, and certainly haven't been calculated in, in the models at the federal level. And on the social side, uh, Eleanor Ostrom won a Nobel Prize for her work talking about um, the fact that co-management and involving local people who are using and know resources and can witness change, they have to be involved if management is gonna work. They have, it's not a privilege. It's not saying we will consult with the fishermen or we will, um, we, they need to have responsibility for the future of the resources they're living in. And that's the idea behind the lobster zones. I don't know if it can hold. It, it's not very well developed right now. And it, um, and, but in the future, taking care of place is going to be absolutely essential. Um, so this is a really tall order. No one's ever done it before. And I just wanted to leave you with some excitement, which is that right here, where the eastern Maine coastal current sweeps the coast, it comes in uh, around Nova Scotia and then sweeps down past us, and then it it, there's a piece of it that sweeps off uh, near Monhegan. That area and the entire watershed, all the way to the headwaters of all the rivers that, that drain into that coast, are part of a first ever collaborative agreement, five-year agreement between the National Marine Fisheries Service, the state of Maine, and the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries in uh, Stonington. And by 2022, they're going to try to develop a framework that will 
would say, how would you, using local knowledge, local people's involvement, local change, um, local fishing, um, how would you actually manage in a way that might adapt to this kind of rapid change? So thank you. We'll, I, we may not have left much time for questions, but we intended to. And, I, and thanks for, so much for coming. With journeyman skippers who are told at the dock when they leave, fill the boat or you'll be finding another job, Cap. Uh, you've eliminated that from the pot and you put it on the skills and abilities of individuals. Uh, and let's face it, some of us have realized that they don't last forever. And all of a sudden, even though you have all of these skills and talents, you're better off ashore. That's what protects lobsters. <laughs>